Hello and welcome to our second event in our Learning Analytics Conversation Series. Uh, we're going to get started in just one moment. If you haven't already, please say a quick hello in the chat so we know who you are and where you're coming from. We've got a nice diverse group of people from uh, many different fields, areas, and places around the world. Uh, please do keep your mute, your mute mic, your mic muted when you're not speaking. Uh, but feel free to ask questions at any time in the chat. Um, I'm going to be monitoring that throughout the session today, and we'll try to admess, address as many of those as possible in the Q&A after the presentation. Uh, also, if you take a look at the URL at the very bottom of the slide, um, if you have other topics that you think would be exciting and perhaps provocative or controversial ones for us to discuss in future learning analytics conversations, uh, please feel free to share those suggestions. Uh, let me begin by uh, welcoming everyone. This is NYU Learn, the Learning Analytics Research Network here at NYU. Uh, you can see all of our social and website information there. And we're working to build the future of data-informed teaching and learning research. I think, especially in line with the topic today, we're working to build a better future with data-informed teaching and learning research. And so one of the topics we'll be talking about today is sort of the purposes and reasons for which we're using learning analytics and how we can help better design tools to get us where we want to go. Um, as I mentioned, if you have ideas for the next event in the conversation series, we're very excited to hear them. Uh, our first one was on scaling up learning analytics. Today we're discussing fairness and equity. Uh, the goal of this new format is to bring together uh, two experts working in the area to share perhaps very different perspectives on the topic and then engage in some dialogue with them and with you. Um, I wanted to just point out a quick shout out to a couple of upcoming events. Uh, the Learning Analytics and Knowledge Conference will be held like everything else online this year. And we've got two papers that people may be interested in. Uh, you do need to register for the conference uh, to attend. The first I'll probably be talking about a little bit at some point today, and it's the idea of subversive learning analytics. Uh, we also have a second paper talking about questions, techniques, and challenges in how instructors make sense of learning analytics based on a study conducted here at NYU. Uh, this, without further ado, I want to introduce you to our topic for today and our uh, first speaker. Uh, our topic is fairness and equity in learning analytics, uh, and we're going to have a conversation with uh, two uh, wonderful scholars. The first is Dr. Paul Prinsloo, who is a research professor in open and distance learning, uh, joining us from the University of South Africa, though from his uh, background, it might be Hogwarts as well. Uh, and then Dr. Ravi Shah, who is the Assistant Professor of Applied Statistics here at NYU, and I believe in the very same building I am, though, of course, in different rooms. Um, they're going to present very different perspectives on fairness and equity uh, in learning analytics. We'll start off with uh, a short talk from Paul uh, entitled Reconciling Learning Analytics and Social Justice, Contemplating the Impossible. Um, I expected nothing less than a provocative and uh, exciting talk from Paul. Uh, since he stepped into the unknown and controversial in 2013, the publication of a collaborative article with Sharon Slade that I'm sure many of you have read, titled Learning Analytics, Ethical Issues and Dilemmas. Paul's research in learning analytics continues to map and interrogate the ethical dimensions of using or not student data to inform teaching and learning. Uh, so with that, let me stop my share and hand it over to Paul for his talk. Great, thank you, Alisa. Thank you, colleagues. Let me just go to presentation mode. Great stuff. Just some opening reflections. So considering fairness and the potential of bias, and as well as social justice has always been part of making evaluative judgments pertaining to student progress and assessment of risk and failure or identifying support needs. So this is not a new topic. So whether it was paper-based assessment in a classroom, in a small classroom, fairness was always there. Fairness was always an issue. Bias was always, a, in, in its potentiality, was always present. Social justice was always there or not. So this is not a new debate. It is part of assessing student progress and assessment of risk of failure and identifying support needs. So why and how does this change when we consider collecting, analyzing and using student digital data to help us understand and support learning? And how does it change and does it change? So my, my perspective on this is that institutions and educators now have access to greater volumes 
velocity, granularity, and a variety of student data than before. There's also this belief that more and better data results in better understanding of learning and more effective student support. And there's also the belief that more data and more powerful algorithms result in fairer decisions and serve justice, serve social justice. And my proposition tonight or this morning is not necessarily. So let's just for a moment consider the impossible. Uh, and, and I would really like to make it clear that my presentation is a critique and not criticism. While criticism asserts that something is wrong and critics unmask in order to judge, critique brings an ethical dimension to bear and aspires, to, aspires less to unmask falsehood than to compel its audience to see matters in a different, but not, not necessarily a truer light. Once again, uh, the issue is not criticism, it is critique to bring an ethical dimension to bear. What the second point is as, as important as the first, that people born into unwelcoming worlds and unreliable environments have a very different response to the new precarities than do people who presume they would be protected. So when I speak to you tonight or today as a white male, 62 years old, gay, in the context of South Africa, my, my experiences of the potential of bias and the potential of being negatively impacted by learning analytics are very, very different from being a black young teenager in, in a very low socioeconomic background. We cannot forget this. So we come from different places. So considering that using the word impossible may hint at hope, we have to consider that for many, it does not signify hope, but rather defiance and refusal. So my proposition is that we should stop thinking in binary terms, learning analytics is good, learning analytics is bad. I really don't think this is helpful. We should rather consider under what conditions can learning analytics be fair and in service of social justice. For me, this is a much more productive question and opening a space for alternative views. This is a beautiful uh, diagram of figure, figure that I found in Mittelstadt and it's also, you found it in Tamados, the references are below, where they just say there's some epistemic concerns regarding al algorithmic bias as well as normative concerns. There's the issue of inconclusive evidence that there's often correlations and not causations, and there's a real danger of apophenia, that we see patterns where there's no actual patterns. The evidence is inscrutable, that if the decision is just announced, you are at risk and you cannot scrutinize the evidence or, or appeal against it. There's misguided evidence that there's bias emerging from data train, training sets. Then there's the normative concerns, there's unfair outcomes. There's a transformative effects when a biased algorithm and its effects become part of ecologies of algorithmic effects. And then there's the issue of traceability when one algorithm or one particular form of algorithmic decision-making become part and morph into an ecology of other algorithms. I also want to situate my, my, my reflection on the impossibility of learning analytics to be fair and in service of social justice against the fact that educational technology like learning analytics need to be understood as a knot of social, political, economic, and cultural agendas that are riddled with complications, contradictions, and conflicts. And data do not exist independently of the ideas, the instruments, the practices, the context, and knowledges used to generate, process, and analyze them. And I speak from the context of a, from South Africa post-apartheid, where the collection of data was never neutral whether I was white or black or colored or Indian, transformed my life, transformed my potential of realizing my, my, my wishes, uh, realizing my life. It impacted on where I lived and where I could not live, where I could go, where I could not go, where I could sit, where I couldn't sit, where I was found to be after nine o'clock at night or not. So data, when we collect data, we cannot think of it, uh, of existing independently of the ideas and the instruments used to process, generate, and analyze them. So this raises the question, who sets the agenda for learning analytics? What is at stake? 
and to what extent is fairness and social justice on the agenda of learning analytics vendors, programmers, and managers? Towards this last three slides, I want to consider what will make the impossible possible. I really think we need to acknowledge from the reality of harm and the potential of unfairness and bias. I think that's a start, that there's always a reality of harm. Secondly, that fairness and social justice are design considerations. If we do not consider these from the moment that we consider collecting a certain set of data, uh, it will not serve fairness. It cannot be in service of social justice. It's a design consideration. We have to reconsider how we think and code student identity as temporary and in flux social material assemblages of intersecting identities, history, effect, and information. I'm, I'm, no, not, I, I'm never a, just a white male, 62 years old. There's a history about my identity of my effect and information. We have to consider the instability of the categories we use, the assumptions underlying these categories and find alternative ways, complementing ways to address the zombiness of our categories. And then we honestly and responsibly, so responsibly acknowledge the limitation and biases of trade data training sets and own up to how these impact on comparisons and predictions. That's the first five that I think what will make the impossible possible if we consider these. The last five includes the following, that learning and student identity fits with difficulty in binaries of zeros and ones. It's, it, it, I think we overestimate the fact that we can code everything to fit between a zero and a one. Student data are imitations for conversations and not permissions for authoritative declaration of risk and or potential. And I think that's one of the dangers of learning analytics that it, 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 it got to, uh, it makes, it, it makes authorit authoritarian or not authoritarian, authoritative claims about you are at risk. According to our evidence, you, you, you will fail or you stand at risk of failing. That authority, uh, we need to open that up and say, let's have a conversation about your risk. It's not a permission for authoritative declarations. Number eight, students need to know what data are collected by whom, used for what purposes, under what conditions, and have access to process and resources to question and or appeal the decisions based on that data. We cannot talk about fairness and social justice if students don't know what data are collected, by whom, when is it used, for what purposes, and under what conditions, if they don't have accesses to the process and the resources to question or appeal the decisions that are based on this data. Number nine, Students are owners of their data and as such have more than a vested interest in being part of any interventions based on the collection, analysis and use of their data. And number 10, we should make institutions legally and publicly responsible for proven bias or un unfair effects of the use of analytics. And I close with this. You call me a misfit, a risk, a dropout and stop out. Your research indicates that students like me may not make it. You ask me questions regarding my financial status, where I live, how many dependents I have. And once I tell you, I become a number on the spreadsheet. I become color coded. I will become part of a structural equation model that reaffirms that people like me don't belong here. Somehow I don't fit in your spreadsheet. But I want you to know that I'm so much more. I'm so much more than how you define me. I'm so much more than my home address, the one I lied about to get access to funding or to get a place in a residence. I'm also a brother, a sister, a mother, a dependent, a caregiver. I don't fit in your press spreadsheets. I'm not a dropout. In your spreadsheets, I'm a refugee, a migrant. I am in exile. Talk to me. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you, Paul. That was very powerful on multiple levels. And that's a poem that you wrote yourself, correct? 
That's right. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, there's a lot, a lot in there. I, I, I'm excited uh, to discuss many of the ideas you raised, but uh, first we're gonna hear from Ravi with a very different kind of talk that I think will provide a, a nice complement, a, a different perspective. Uh, let me give a little uh, introduction to, to point out one of the things we're trying to do in these conversations is bring together so many different perspectives. And I think Paul has illustrated uh, beautifully some of the macro level issues that are so important when we're talking about fairness and equity. Um, and there's a lot of inspiration there. One of the questions I know many of us struggle with is how do we take this inspiration and, and turn it into specific action? Um, and I think uh, in that respect, uh, we are fortunate to have Rob here to show us something that is um, more concrete and tangible, but I think speaks to many of the principles that Paul is working towards. Uh, so the, the second talk by Dr. Ravi Shroff is towards transparent and interpretable models, simple rules to guide expert classifications. Ravi is an assistant professor of applied statistics and urban informatics in the Department of Applied Statistics, Social Science and Humanities and the Center for Urban Science and Progress here at New York University. His research interests are broadly related to computational social science, and in particular, the application of statistical and machine learning methods to a variety of urban issues. Uh, we're especially excited to have you, Ravi, here with us today to share the research he's done, working to build models that are both transparent and interpretable to support expert decision-making. While his work is often conducted in other areas of the social sciences, such as criminal justice, his methods offer exciting transferability to the educational context. Thus, as he presents, I encourage you to imagine the ways in which his approach to developing simple, statistically informed rules to guide expert decision-making offer what I see as an exciting alternative to the often black box predictive models we commonly see in education. Specifically, you might think about the kinds of decisions made by teachers, administrators, and advisors that this approach could best support and how this would intersect with some of the big picture issues of fairness, equity, and social justice that Paul raised for us. Uh, Ravi? Thank you so much. Um, let me just share my screen and make it full screen. All right, so I'm gonna assume everybody can um, see my slides and uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Paul, for that powerful presentation. Um, really uh, gave me a lot to think about as well. So um, I'm gonna to talk to you about um, uh, simple rules to guide expert classifications. And this is joint work with Zhang Binjung, Connor Concanon, Sharad Goyle, and Daniel Goldstein. So I'd like to start with um, just this observation, which is uh, when making decisions in a large, across a large variety of fields, experts often rely on their experience and intuition, even though to date, a large body of evidence shows that these kinds of judgments are generally outperformed in some sense by those based on statistical models. And so what do I mean when I'm, you know, what are the contexts that I'm thinking of? You could imagine, say, uh, doctors diagnosing patients based on their symptoms, managers deciding which customers to target, uh, judges deciding which defendants to release before trial or not. And so, you know, this um, raises a question, well, you know, why, what are the reasons why humans are sometimes limited in their abilities to make accurate predictions? Well, one is that, um, you know, we're not always great at detecting even correlations in, in data accurately. Um, we also have limitations on our memory, on our attention span, uh, our, our computational abilities, um, and we frequently receive, um, don't receive reliable feedback on, on the predictions that we do make. So this sort of raises a question, which is why might practitioners in these disciplines, and you, know, you could imagine learning analytics as well, why might practitioners then avoid using statistical models to inform their decisions. And you know, I think that there's probably a variety of reasons for this, but one of them in particular is that uh, statistical models can be difficult to understand, they can be difficult to create, and they can be difficult to apply. So this um, sort of prompted uh, our, our motivation, which is you know, what if instead of these maybe complicated black box style statistical models, practitioners could use simple statistically informed decision rules that are fast, frugal, and clear. And so what do I mean by each of those three qualities? Well, when I say fast, what I mean is that decisions can be made in, in one's own mind. 
without the aid of a computing device. When I say frugal, I mean that decisions require only limited amounts of information to make it, uh, to, to sort of come to a conclusion. And then when I say clear, I mean that the grounds upon which any determination is made should also be clear, it should be exposed. And I wanna emphasize here that what I'm talking about really are um, decision support tools. So I'm not talking about replacing human decision makers with, with some kind of algorithm or statistical model, but rather uh, providing a means to support better, more accurate, more fair, let's say decisions um, by a, a human decision maker. So what are the benefits of a simple and transparent style of decision, decision aid? Well, um, one benefit is simple, transparent rules might be more likely to be used and adopted consistently if stakeholders understand um, what these rules are, are doing. Secondly, is that transparency can engender trust. In, in fact, it may be a legal requirement in certain, um, in certain places. And importantly, and I think this, this sort of connects to some of the themes that have been raised, uh, can facilitate auditing. So if you understand how a model is being used, if you can sort of write it down or, or, or you know, even keep it in your head, it's sort of easier to argue about the specific factors that are used relative to something where you, know, you don't really know what's going on under the hood. Third, um, you know, as sort of suggested by my previous slide, uh, these kinds of, um, you know, sort of decision support aids might actually um, render decisions or help humans um, make decisions that are more accurate than if they didn't uh, have access to these kinds of systems. And then the last thing, you know, which might be sort of surprising or counterintuitive, it, it certainly was to me when, when we first started doing this, this project, is that, you know, in many circumstances, these kinds of simple statistically informed rules can actually be Compar uh, comparable in performance to more complicated black box decision supports, de decision support tools. So, okay, so what am I talking about when I say simple, transparent decision rules? Um, really, I'm gonna focus on one class of these rules, which are integer weighted checklists. And so I'll, I'll give you an example of, of what I mean by this. So suppose, for example, that um, I'm trying, I'm a doctor and I'm trying to diagnose uh, whether or not a patient has some particular illness. Um, and, you know, maybe I should have had a more learning analytics appropriate example here, but um, let's go with it. So um, this is a checklist here. It has three factors, whether or not a patient who comes in has high blood pressure, has a rapid heart rate, or has an elevated temperature, or maybe some combination of these three factors. And then a patient also gets a score, depending on which of the factors that they have. For example, if they have high blood pressure, they would get a score of one. And at the end, the patient comes in, you add up their scores, you get a total, and then perhaps you make a decision based on whether that total is above some threshold or not. So just to sort of illustrate pictorially how this might work, a patient might come in with high blood pressure and high temperature, um, and we'd say, okay, well, they have high blood pressure, so they get a score of one. They have an elevated temperature, so they get a score of three. Their total score is four. And so we might say this patient is... Um, you know, uh, uh, has an illness if we were going to use this threshold of three. So um, a few things I want to highlight about this, um, this checklist. And so this is an example of a simple interpretable model. Here I just made it up. I didn't derive it using data or statistics or anything. I just made it up. Um, but I want to highlight a few factors. So one is um, this only uses a small number of binary factors to make a decision, just three factors. Um, the weights are small integers, just one, two, or three, and you could easily do this whole procedure in your head. So the question now is how might you make a checklist like this if you had some, say, historical data set of, um, for example, patient characteristics and their outcomes, whether or not they actually had, had the, the, the illness. Um, and of course, the same procedure would work in a variety of other domains. So uh, the procedure that, um, that we describe is um, called select regression round for reasons that will soon be become clear. It's, uh, it's, it's three stages. Um, so the first, the first stage, and, and again, right, just to set the stage, this is about um, how we might use historical data to create checklists of the form that we saw in the previous slide. So the first stage is, um, you know, oftentimes you have a lot of information available to you, say about a student or about a patient. Um, so choose some subset of those features. And, you know, you choose a smaller subset if you want a simpler checklist, a larger su subset if, if um, having more factors doesn't matter as much. And you can do this in a variety of ways. And, and we describe methods that use both domain knowledge and some automated feature selection, um, something like forward stepwise selection, if you're familiar with that. Once you have this subset, 
um, of features that you've selected or predictors that you've selected, you fit a regression model on those features um, to get fitted coefficients. That's the second stage, the regress stage. Um, you know, we used a, a logistic regression model, but you could use a, um, a variety of other sort of linear models. And then the third step is you just rescale these coefficients to be in some sort of bounded range, small bounded range, and you just round them so they're all integers. And that's the, pro that's the procedure. That's the procedure in a nutshell. So in some sense, um, if you're familiar with fitting regression models, um, if you're familiar with, say, variable selection methods, and even if you aren't, if you're just sort of comfortable selecting some features based on domain knowledge, then you could carry out this, you could carry out this procedure. Um, so what I want to highlight about this three-step strategy is it can be used to create simple decision rules, um, but the strategy itself is, is fairly simple. Um, you know, you could you could construct these rules using pretty moderate levels of statistical knowledge and free or widely available software packages. And you can apply the rules without a computer, right? Just like the checklist I showed you several slides ago could be applied in your head. And so we really think that that's one of the advantages is, um, you know, there's a lot of work about developing simple statistical models, but this approach is um, a simple approach to develop these simple models. So just to go through some applications and then I'll wrap up my, my short presentation is uh, we applied this, this technique in the context of stop and frisk decisions made by police officers in New York City. And we constructed a three item checklist for guiding police officer decisions. And we found that if officers use this checklist, this was in theory, this wasn't actually implemented. Um, if officers use this checklist, we, we estimate that they could make fewer stops while preserving the crime prevention benefits um, of the stops that they make in terms of weapons that they take off the streets and mitigating racial disparities with, again, not some complicated black box machine learning model, but a checklist of the, of the sort that I showed you several slides ago. In another um, context, I'll actually show you um, one of these checklists that we derived. So we also looked at uh, pretrial detention decisions. So this is a sort of area and a decision point in the criminal justice system in the United States that's gotten a lot of attention recently. And the, uh, the decision is um, for judges to make whether or not a defendant is released before trial without any conditions or released um, on cash bail. Uh, and so we constructed um, using this select regress round method, a, a two variable checklist that just uses a defendant's age and their previous history of failing to appear for trial to inform judicial decisions about whether or not a defendant is likely to fail to appear for their subsequent um, court appearance. And so you can see here that um, this is a checklist. It has, I guess, maybe seven items, but really um, concerns two variables. And there's just an, a small integer score. And so if a defendant, for example, example, comes in and one knows their age and their previous history of failing to appear for court, one could compute this score. And then in theory, that score could inform a judge's decision. Again, not replace a judge's decision, but inform a judge's decision. And so there's some tricky statistical issues um, underlying this estimation, but uh, we um, estimate that judges could simultaneously release more defendants without having uh, an increased rate in failure to appear for trial. Um, so both of those things are perhaps not, um, not bad. Uh, and then we also looked more generally at a bunch of publicly available data sets, and we found that this procedure has similar performance to more complicated black box prediction methods. Um, so that's sort of one of the punchlines is that um, in many contexts, you, these kinds of simple checklists actually do pretty well. They do comparably to much more complicated models. And so I'd just like to close my presentation before we get to the conversation with a few, a few thoughts that, um, you know, and I think this, is, this sort of ties in nicely with some of the aspects of Paul's presentation that, um, you know, there are a variety of technical approaches to any given situation, including, of course, don't do any technical approach at all. Um, and the kinds of uh, methods that I've showed here and that I'm also interested in are those that are shaped by um, not just sort of hard technical questions, but in particular by ethical or legal or practical constraints, right? Like, is it really realistic to assume that decision makers are going to be able to use some complicated statistical model um, or not? Are there legal restrictions on the factors that can be used in such models? Um, are there, e even if these factors are legal, are there ethical questions that we should ask about what sorts of pieces of information should be should be used. I mean, you know, um, in this checklist that I showed you, age is one of the factors, which is something that, well, you can't really do, some, do anything about that. Um, 
so the, the, the final thought that I want to um, leave you with is that these applications are examples of what's sometimes called algorithm in the loop decision making. So a human being, a judge or a doctor or a teacher is making some decision already. And then the idea is that these decision support tools could be used to inform that decision, but not replace it. Um, and there's a lot left to learn, uh, at least to my knowledge, in this sort of interplay between human decision makers and statistically derived um, decision aids. And that's all I've got. So thank you. I'll stop the slides. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ravi, for a very different and very interesting talk. I think uh, putting your specific focus on methods uh, together with some of the issues Paul raised is going to lead to an exciting conversation. Uh, let me just take a minute then to uh, spotlight Paul, spotlight Ravi, and throw myself into the mix. Um, hopefully everyone should be seeing the three of us uh, large as life. Um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to start off with a couple of questions that I've prepared and then we will move to some of the questions in the chat and I'll invite people who've asked questions in the chat to uh, speak up and share their questions with the group. I see a couple already, but feel free to add them as, as we move along. <sighs> so many things to talk about. Um, Thank you. Let me st let me start with this. Thank you both for such interesting talks. I think they provide a really nice complement to each other. Um, as I mentioned, you know, Paul's raised some really, really big picture issues of how do we make the impossible possible and see learning analytics as a tool for social justice, supporting equity and fairness. Um, and Robbie took us deep into the details of one specific approach that offers a tangible way to do this, perhaps. So. Uh, what I'm hoping to do in our conversation is link these macro and micro lenses. And I want to start with a really basic question about the relationship between data and intuition or the other ways we make decisions. Um, I think both of you have sort of pointed out two sides of a, a public discourse I've seen quite a bit around the use of learning and other analytics that you know, people have talked a lot now about how introduction of analytics is you know, raising questions about fairness, equity, bias and justice, but you've both pointed to ways in which these questions have always been a part of high stakes evaluative judgments. And you know, Ravi in particular has pointed to ways in which algorithms might offer a better basis for making such decisions still made by humans than, than simply relying on our intuition. You know, we've, we've all seen lots of ways in which we have uh, implicit bias. And so in some ways we worry about algorithms introducing bias, but we can also see them as a tool to reduce it. And so this is obviously uh, quite a tension. And I guess I would ask you first to each reflect on that notion of algorithms as a source of bias versus a remedy for it. Paul, you want to go first or should I? <laughs> I think you go first. Thanks, Ravi. Sure, sure. So, um, so I don't think that there's any any easy answers that I know of, you know, like in, in Paul's talk, I was, I was sort of struck by the, the list of 10 items and how all of those kind of resonate with me um, that, that really, you know, if one engages in, um, you know, sort of using statistics and modeling approaches to inform decision making, then one really has to be like extremely careful, I think, in a variety of ways. And to some extent, um, my impression is that it's only relatively recently that, you um, a lot of uh, the sort of more technical disciplines have begun seriously grappling with some of these issues, you know? So there's this area of sometimes called fair machine learning, um, although it really encompasses um, work from a variety of different disciplines, including the social sciences and humanities, uh, that's become, you know, exploded because of the kind of rise of these sorts of analytic systems being used to inform very high stakes decisions. Um, and so I don't think that there's any silver bullet that I know of for, designing a system that will reduce inequity um, and, and sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's also often very hard to know ahead of time um, what the eventual, you know, what the downstream effects of introducing any of these kinds of things actually will, will be. Um, so, you know, one, one of the things that I like to 
I, I guess I have a few, yeah, maybe high level points that I think might be relevant in how I think about it. So, so one, one thing is I think about these sorts of um, algorithmic or analytic approaches as essentially being just another way to summarize information. So, you know, these are just um, at the end of the day, right? A checklist is a piece of paper, or, or maybe it's just a set of numbers on a screen. Um, and whether or not somebody gets a number of a four or a three doesn't actually translate to anything in the real world unless it's coupled with some kind of action, right? Like a sort of intervention. And you could imagine um, for the same, um, for this exactly the same output of a, of a tool or a, or a model, making a variety of different decisions. You know, do you provide a supportive intervention? Do you provide a punitive intervention? Do you provide additional resources? And so I feel like that has to be part of the conversation as well, right? One can't just think about these sorts of tools in isolation. One has to think about them as part of this entire ecosystem of, of decision making. And, you know, there's some examples we've, we've seen where uh, in the criminal justice setting, um, uh, these sort of uh, uh, statistically derived decision aids are being used, you know, th throughout the United States and, and perhaps in other countries to inform decisions. And in some jurisdictions, um, you know, decision makers are just ignoring them. And so that could be, you know, it could be a bad thing if those kinds of systems might actually lead to increased, um, you know, fairness and, and, and equity. It could be a good thing if they're going to, in fact, entrench bias um, uh, and, and sort of make the, make the situation worse. Um, so, so that's, that's sort of one, one high level thought. Another high level thought is that, you know, in many of the circumstances that, um, that I consider, we're, we're, we're talking about decisions that are already being made by humans. So, um, you know, teachers might already be making decisions about which students are eligible for which classes. Judges are already making decisions, um, about, you know, which, which defendant should be released before trial or not. And one of the reasons we're concerned about fairness and equity is because the historical practice of, you know, the way those decisions have been, been made is, 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 not, uh, is, is less than ideal. Um, and so, you know, the promise is that, is that there's some better way which sort of um, augments, let's say, the human decision-making process to sort of summarize, uh, summarize information in the most effective manner so that they can make the, the right decision, whatever, whatever that is. And in some, in some cases, there's no, there's no right decision. So I feel like the way that these tools should be sort of thought about sometimes is, is you know, relative to uh, the historical practice, right? So maybe not relative to a world in which there's no bias and in which there's no, you know, no wrong decision that's ever made, but relative to what we have now where humans are making decisions. And, you know, in some ways I think about the human brain as being the ultimate black box because, um, you know, you, you know, some, you could ask somebody like, why did you make this decision? But you don't really know if that's, if that's the, 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 um, if that's sort of the real reason. Whereas with these kinds of simple checklists, you know, if somebody got a score of four, you can see exactly why they got a score of four. And then you may, you might be able to argue about that, right? And you might be able to say, look, I think this checklist is terrible. But, but I would argue that even being able to say that this checklist is a terrible idea is perhaps an improvement over some kind of modeling approach where you can't even peer inside. Um, so I, I will say, and then and then I'll I'll, I'll stop talking. Um, I will say that I am often pretty torn about uh, some of the ethical questions that arise in this kind of research, um, especially when especially the question around you know if by studying ways to optimize decision making in some framework that is fundamentally immoral. Do you, um, you know, are you sort of legitimizing that framework, right? And, and this question in my world comes up most saliently in the context of pretrial detention decisions, which, you know, are within this system of cash bail, which is, um, you know, I, I sort of feel confident in saying, at least to me, it's like fundamentally immoral. And so there's these questions like, you know, is it even ethical to do research on this stuff? Um, and I, I don't know, I, I don't have good answers, but um, it's something that I think about. So, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking and I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Ravi. I would like to start with two examples. I think the first example, uh, I don't think the American audience will understand, but only people traveling to America with a non-American passport may have a glimpse of the, uh, the, 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 the raw terror that one faces when you enter Atlanta and there's no human at, uh, inside, but you have to scan your passport and then the machine tells you to go, not to go to point C or D or E, but it routes you to F. No explanation. You, you are routed to F. You get to F and then it routes you to G. And you have no understanding of what in your passport triggered 
these responses and there's no human insight to say uh, why, why. So that is utter terror when you don't understand the decision or the reasons or the decisions on which you are being valued. Uh, I always relied, before these systems came into place, I always relied on my charming smile or the fact that I'm a white male, that I could somehow ease my way through, through uh, border control, make a joke, make it, but there's no human. Second example is I grew up in apartheid South Africa and when my dad went to the bank to apply for a loan, he was white, he was a minor, but the bank manager was also a, a friend. So the, despite my dad's terrible credit record, he was white and he was friends with the bank manager and that eased himself into to getting a loan or getting, getting more funds. Nowadays, I apply for, for a loan at an automatic teller machine and, and there's no way I can raise a concern or raise an issue and I'm sure today, even if I would apply for a loan through ATM, the fact that I'm white, the fact, fact that I have tenure, the fact that I'm 62 years old, sets into motion a, a range of decisions that a black male, the same age and the same tenure may not have access to. And I think that raises my, my final point uh, is that I do think we have to distinguish between high stake decisions and low stake decisions. I really think that that is, that is crucial that with low stake decisions in learning, if it's, if it's a decision to, to provide extra support or additional reading or whatever, that's fairly low stake. But if it is to prevent the student from, from registering a following up course, which can be, low, can be life changing, for me, that's a high stake environment. And I would not like to leave that decision to an algorithmic decision-making system on its own. I would love to have human oversight there, even if it's a simple regress. What's the other part? <laughs> even if it's a very simple step, I would love to have a way to petition, to appeal, to understand on what basis it is made. So the, with that, I, I do think that the systems can help us to be less biased but it, it is never neutral and we, we must hold it to account. Whew, there's, there's a lot. <laughs> Thank you to both of you for, for those thoughts. I, I'm wrestling in my own head with some things as I'm trying to speak. So uh, let me try to work through. I think, I think there's something important that you're both pointing out in perhaps the partnership between humans and algorithms. We know that human decision-making on its own has its problems. And there were some nice comments from Carolyn and Lucy in the, the chat about a parallel to teachers and rubrics. The notion, you know, I know a B when I see it versus a rubric, which is in some sense not, uh, not data-derived, but it is a set of simple rules for assigning a grade. And the notion is to apply the rules more fairly. Um, and so we know human judgment has problems, but we also see from, from Paul's examples, the ways in which, you know, abdicating responsibilities to something that's lockstep and doesn't have room for nuance has problems too. And so I think maybe, you know, you, you both speak to how do we set up systems that allow this partnership to take on its, uh, its good forms and avoid its more nefarious ones? Because certainly you could imagine a partnership between humans and data, and we've seen these in the past, where, you know, um, intentional or not, somebody is using the data to sort of provide support for a position they maybe already had versus vice versa. And so there's this notion of openness. Um, I want, I'm going to do something a little different than I did last time, which is I see some questions coming in that kind of tie to what we're talking about. So before I move the conversation, I'm going to uh, tie to a question that's in, in the chat. And I think one of the things that uh, you both pointed out is uh, the importance of transparency. You know, Paul described how when your passport sends you down a different path and you don't know why, you, you know, there's this lack of agency and you don't understand what's going on. And I think Robbie pointed out that even if the simple rules produced by, uh, you know, one of his systems or, or anyone's systems might not be ones we like, at least then we can see them and talk about them, right? They become an external object for conversation. And so uh, while, you know, it doesn't solve everything, I, I like the idea of the human brain being the ultimate black box and algorithms at least putting things on the table. Um, 
But you both also mentioned how this ties into sort of historical systems and patterns. And uh, I wanted to, to invite uh, Josh, Joshua Quick, if you're still there, to, to say a little bit about your question about trust and the, you know, how people can trust decisions, even if it appears to be transparent, when there's sort of a reason for skepticism based on how things have done in the past. And so, you know, we might see these systems of rules, but understanding, well, why do, you know, the numbers get higher, you know, it's not a linear system, the models you create, or, you know, you mentioned someone can't change their age, well, they can also not change their race or gender. So if that pops out as a factor, there's these issues of fairness. So um, Josh, do you want to say a little more about your, your question about the issue of trust and then maybe Ravi and Paul can respond? Uh, sure. Thanks, Alyssa. So essentially, it's it's how can we make apparent to, to those that we are making these decisions that we are acting within what we believe their best interests are. And to me, it seems that we need to have some type of negotiation on what our values and, and our judgments are with those groups. And I, I was just wondering, can the panel kind of speak to, do they see ways to enable that kind of negotiation and trust building through uh, interactions with students and particularly students who have been impacted by uh, bias and unjust systems? Everyone's muted. <laughs> Sorry, Paul, Paul you're muted. <laughs> I was muted when okay. I asked. <laughs> so if 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 uh, in response to Josh, I think if 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 I was a black male, eighteen years old, and you asked me to trust the system, I would just say, "Go kiss your ass." I mean, there's no way. There's no way that I will trust the system. There's a history. There's a there's there's like an example back into generations why when we trusted the system, it just backfired. So trust is relative and we must have room and must have space for that we don't trust systems equally because there is a history. So I do think Joshua, I think it's an excellent question. So uh, how do we both trust? Uh, and, 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 and I don't have the answer to that. Uh, I don't have the answer to that. Ravi, I don't know whether you have answered. I, I have some thoughts. I guess I I, I wouldn't um, I, I I wouldn't say that I have have an answer either. But I, I guess maybe a few things that come to mind. So one is, um, you know, there's I I feel like there's um, sometimes the ways that these kinds of systems are deployed in practice, uh, you know, in, in in reality, boil down to some you know some data scientists in a room making some decisions, building some system that then gets deployed and used, uh, you know, and impacts the lives of lots and lots of people. And, and in particular, in that procedure that I just described, um, there's perhaps very little or zero input from the people who were impacted by the decisions, let alone the sort of wider community. And so I think that in particular for things that are in the public interest, right? So I, I'm not sort of talking about like, you know, the actions that Google might take here, although, you know, maybe even those are arguably um, uh, impact the public interest as well. But I'm thinking about, you know, decisions that teachers make, that police officers make, that, that judges make. Um, you know, I, I feel like those should not be exempt. The use of such systems in these kinds of systems in those contexts shouldn't be exempt from um, community participation, right? Like if you think this is a good idea, you should be able to explain it to the people in the community, and in particular, the, the, the group of people who are affected by this. And, and you know, hopefully, they would agree that it's a good idea, right? Um, and I think that a lot of, um, you know, again, I'm sort of closest to the criminal justice world in terms of my my domain knowledge, but um, I think that there's been, in many ways, a big uh, um, sort of uh, skepticism and distrust has come from the way that um, these kinds of algorithmically informed or statistically informed um, decision support tools have been used in those settings where there's, you know, no oversight. Um, you know, often there's a kind of active, active uh, people actively trying to hide the fact that they're using these kinds of systems. Um, there are sometimes, you know, uh, systems that are developed by private companies that um, sort of claim that their copyright would be infringed if they uh, revealed the, the details of their algorithm. Um, and so those are all things that that strike me as, you know, obviously, obviously bad. Um, and so, you know, to some extent, I, I would say that there are some steps that one could take to try and ensure that if these systems are going to be used, that they're going to be, you know, used in a manner which at least as many people are on board with as possible. And so, you know, one is, yeah, involving the community, um, involving other domain experts. Um, another is, is sort of building things in-house, not, not contracting with, 
private companies that um, consider their their software as a trade secret. Um, but you know, in general, I think I think it's th there's no escaping the sort of normative questions here, right? Like, which decisions do we want to use these tools for? Which outcomes are we trying to predict? Which pieces of information are we going to use? Um, I'll give you actually one example. So you know, in my slides, I showed you this two item checklist or this two variable checklist for aiding judicial decisions. And so the first version that we, you know, our kind of uh, procedure spat out included an indicator for unstable housing. Um, and unstable housing, you could imagine, could be problematic to use as an input into making a recommendation for a variety of reasons, right? And, and in particular, it might be unfair to people of various, you know, ethno-racial groups. Um, it might have, you know, it's another factor that somebody may not have control over. And so we talked with with um, people in this jurisdiction in, in the court system, and you know we were like, okay, like maybe maybe if you're going to use this rule, it, it makes sense to not use this factor. So let's go back to the drawing board and let's see if we can come up with a rule that doesn't use this factor. Um, and that that was the one that you know the, what we what we came up with was the one that I showed you. But um, we couldn't even have had that discussion if we were talking about some you know if we weren't talking about something that um, sort of everybody in the room could give feedback on. Right, and so you know, if we were talking about a neural network model or a random forest model or something, which is maybe um, requires more technical sophistication, then you know it would have been a lot more challenging to even have those arguments about like, is this a good idea in the first place? And if it is, maybe not a terrible idea. How can we implement it in a, in a way that avoids as many of the pitfalls as possible? So. We have so many good questions coming in that it's very hard to choose. I'm going to briefly mention a couple that I'm we're not going to have time for. And then I think for the last five minutes, I want to bring you to what I think is the most provocative one at all. Um, but briefly, there's some great questions about uh, building on what you both just described about how do we get the people who are going to be effective in the room to help design the analytics? This is something uh, we've been working on, uh, JP Sarmiento. Uh, has been working on participatory design methods, particularly how do you work with populations who don't necessarily understand tons about data, but will be affected by it. Um, there's also an interesting question from Javier about the difference between human in the loop and algorithm in the loop kinds of decisions and um, ways in which the analytics might help us think about our expectations and uh, make different decisions. And finally, one by Alejandro about the tension between everything we're discussing now and the push towards more and more complicated models such as neural nets that we're seeing in the technical side of the field. Um, but what I wanna push us to is uh, something asked uh, a bit earlier by Bonza and I have been thinking about it myself. So I'm gonna tell you my piece and then I'm gonna ask if Bonza wants to, to add theirs as well. Um, my, uh, my, my thought has been, you know, both of you brought up the underlying system. You know, Paul uh, sort of said, well, what about these categories? You know, we don't want to treat labels as permanent. People are changing, even the categories are changing. And, you know, Ravi said uh, at point blank, you know, even if we're making a system better, if the system itself is fundamentally immoral and flawed, how do we ever get out of it? And, you know, in our work, we've been talking about this idea of subversive learning analytics to point to how analytics inherently work to preserve a system because they're based on historical data. They're based on what we have. And so my, my question has to do with how do we start to create models that lead us towards the world we want to live in rather than replicate the one we do? And um, Mons, I don't know if you have anything to add. You asked a little bit about what if we threw out data categories and worried less about people's history and more about their trajectory to the future. Is there anything you want to Yes, thank you. Uh, so for me, the identities that I'm mostly interested in are, are the identities that are created inside of the course, um, not based on the demographics. So I was just wondering um, if, if the way that we develop interventions would be ineffective if we just drop all the demographics and we just focus on what actually is happening in the course and how the students are actually engaging with the material. I guess I, maybe I'll, I'll take a quick stab at this and, and then hand it off to Paul. So um, just a few thoughts, I guess, um, uh, uh, Elisa and, and Bonza. Um, so one is that um, it's a pretty thorny question about whether or not to use demographic attributes in these kinds of systems. And the kind of like immediate, um, 
inclination I feel like that um, many people feel, um, probably myself included, is, is that it's sort of like always a bad idea to include, to sort of explicitly include, let's say, race or gender, um, you know, just to focus on those kind of sensitive demographic attributes for a second um, in, in a model. But um, I guess there are two, two sort of relevant things. So one is that pretty much everything is correlated with everything else. Um, and so, you know, race and gender are, 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 and sex are, are so intimately connected with, you know, where you live and what you were doing on a particular day and your income and, you know, um, that, that it, uh, you know, it can be inadequate in some sense to merely not explicitly use these kinds of categories. And then the second, the second observation is, is to this, this idea of getting to the world that we want to get to. And, and so there, you know, there's this sort of um, tension between having sort of maybe models that are colorblind or, or, or gender blind or race blind, um, and those that sort of actively use those, inf those pieces of information to try and achieve maybe a more just conclusion. Um, or more, or more, or more just, or more equitable outcome, and and so you know, my impression is is that in many circumstances, it actually makes more sense to include those attributes explicitly, um, and uh, rather than to rather than to ignore them, because it can help to sort of um, correct for past patterns of um, bias and discrimination that we see. And just to give one quick concrete example of this, that we sometimes see in the pretrial detention context, that um, women and men that look observationally identical, except for their except for their sex that's listed in the data, um, women often tend to recidivate at rates that are lower than men who look otherwise identical. And uh, in that case, one could argue that not explicitly using um, sex or gender in one's model could lead to sort of overestimating um, riskiness, detaining women who shouldn't be, who shouldn't actually be detained. So that's, um, that's sort of one one thought, I guess, and, and maybe because I know we're almost out of time, I'll stop talking and, and, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Paul. Just just very quickly, thanks, Ravi. Uh, I, I, from speaking from a South African context, uh, I don't think we can afford not to take into account demographics because of the historical legacy of colonialism and apartheid. We, we just cannot ignore race. A friend of mine always say when someone say, but I don't see color, it scares him to death because how do that? How does that person get through a traffic light if they don't see color? Uh, so I do think we have to take account or uh, be accountable to the effect of race and gender. But it's ne never just one attribute. It's never just I'm never just black or never just white or I'm always a combination. So I think in the categories we use, however unstable they are. I think if we can broaden the categories to provide a more nuanced picture of who is this white 60 year old blah 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 man, a more composite picture, and it will never be the real Paul or the new and the real Elisa. They will always be a Paul that's outside of that. But at least if we try and attempt to to build a more holistic picture, I think that's one way to go. And that actually points to a couple of comments that were made uh, getting towards intersectionality about the, the categories we have and the data we have. I had an interesting conversation earlier today with someone in uh, our Office of Equity, Inclusion and Belonging about the difference between the iPads categories, which sort of put people into a few race buckets and the ways people see themselves that are these complex assemblages and intersections of um, you know, race and sex and, and different factors, um, all sorts of things mixed together. And so uh, thinking about the categories we use and thinking about the, the, the variables, the way we're indexing people and the data we're collecting in the first place, right? We, we can only build models on the, the data we have. And I think you've both pointed to ways in which these models can at least reveal the situation that we wanna change, even if it can't always necessarily show us the vision of the, the future world. I feel like we could talk for another hour, but I, I know in the world of Zoom, everyone's probably two minutes late for another conversation. So uh, I want to say that uh, we're gonna pause for now. I, I think this is a conversation that hopefully we're able to pick up and continue with, uh, with all of you in whatever format in the future. It seems like there's a lot, a lot more to engage with here. Thank you deeply, Paul and Ravi for joining us today. Uh, for your talks and your conversation. Uh, I know this is a recording I'm going to want to go back and view because I think there was so much there. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Those of you who asked questions, those of you who asked questions in the chat but we didn't get to answer them, I apologize. There was just so much. Um, but we'll share those around afterwards and perhaps people will have a few words to share with you afterwards. Um, we'll be sending out notes about future events.
And uh, I think that's it. Thanks so much and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alyssa. Thank you, Paul. Have a good one.